Hey, welcome back, everybody, to Backtrekking, the podcast where we look back at the real-world inspirations behind classic episodes of Star Trek. I'm one of your hosts, Caliban. Your other host is right here. Hey, it's me, Gooey Fame. How's it going? Gooey! Hey. When you wake up, come find me. Ah, I like it. Let me just go back through it a couple times. Uh, <laughs> we'll skip that part, though, because uh, we're already caught in a loop here. We're doing this show and going back week after week. We're a part of the Just Enough Trope podcast network, which is home to many shows about your favorite topics like TVs, films, comic books, video games, and music. You can find out more by going to justenoughtrope.com or by following at Just Enough Trope on Twitter. Keep the geek fires burning. My parents were wrong. I should keep reading comic books and playing video games. What would happen? What would happen if I had listened to them? Well, I'd be a doctor, a square doctor, but I wouldn't have a uh, podcast network about all that fun stuff. Oh, truly. And, you know, now you're prepared. You could save the world from the mimics. Um... <laughs> oh, man. well, I mean, anybody could. I think that's <laughs> kind of the, the theme of, of the film we're going to talk about. Is, mm, okay. uh, anybody could if you give them uh, 10,000 years or, or whatever uh, to keep on trying. But keeping on... Keep it on, keep it on is the uh, is the real goal or, or, or moral, I think. Oh, truly. Yeah, I mean, it's not like I had a crystal ball or anything. I just love this stuff so much that I couldn't stop. And it, I lucked out because apparently um, I'm part of a generation of um, man babies who uh, all like this stuff and won't <laughs> let go of it. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, you know, it's celebrated now, so. What if, like, sci-fi had been a phase or a fad, like... I don't know. Um, I think the fun or, or like popular example would be uh, in Watchmen, you know, they have uh, the comic book or like the TV show, movie, whatever. Uh, they have superheroes in the real world. And so therefore, like superhero comics, people were like, eh, they weren't really interested because there's like real life superheroes. And it was just sort of a fad in entertainment. So they all read, okay. pirate, they all read pirate comic books instead. Well, in our world, like... Sure, you get a pirate movie every once in a while. Uh, Johnny Depp made a few of them, but like we don't have like pirates. We're not infused with pirates mm. all the time. So what if like uh, you know what if like sci-fi just sort of died out and people were like, I like like real draw. I like um, drawing room mysteries, uh, and I like uh, real life <laughs> nautical themed novels. But spacemen, I don't think so. You know what? There's st- there's still time for superhero movies to <laughs> to die out, or like sci- sci-fi and superhero movies. I think. Yeah, I mean, what do you do if we're all taking the shuttle to the moon for work? You know what I mean? Like, you don't uh, care about somebody uh, living on a moon base or something like that, which is uh, a, mo- a movie that Tom Cruise is working on uh, for oh. 2020 or 2021. Yeah. Well, that yeah, that reminds me. Like, I like in Star Trek, uh, sometimes they are, like, kind of bored by space, which is kind of fun. <laughs> that's yeah that's the ultimate when you can be bored by something that's amazing then you've just fully assimilated it yeah they're they're over television you know so yeah right <laughs> well uh we haven't uh, met up in a while but we are hitting the ground running already so yes. no rust on us uh although i have seen you on the discord for the network oh yeah it's been fun uh hanging out and chatting about all kinds of stuff actually yeah, uh, we have uh, a general sort of chat room, and then we have little side alcoves to talk about specific things and the shows on our network. So come join us if you would. <laughs> I'll leave a link in our show notes, which is just an open link to join the uh, Just Enough Trope server on Discord. Discord is one of those things that like, I used it a little bit for like online gaming uh, like when it first came out, and then I didn't really continue using mm. it like when i was done i don't know counter striking or whatever but <laughs> in in the past couple of years like it's really grown uh, in a surprising way as a uh, chat and a communications tool yeah it's pretty cool like that's i got the idea from it because we use it over at zelda dungeon and it's it's nice because you know we use it to communicate between everyone who's working on stuff but also it ended up being a cool way to talk about uh you know the Zelda games, or like if someone needs uh, help with a game, you can pop up in there. Oh, so yeah, yeah okay. it's got all kinds of uses. So that's cool. Yeah, I, uh, I I keep waiting for like somebody to win the um, communications app war because I've got like. For work, I have like a Slack and I've got Discord ah, yeah. and I've got like all these different things that I have to keep track of. And it's like, won't somebody just? Uh, where's the Google monopoly in this space already? 
Oh yeah. I just want to give all my Google. money to one. Yeah, please take take this thing over. Eliminate my choice. <laughs> oh no, that's so dystopic. <laughs> that we're ba- we're begging for the monopoly. No, this competition, please. Uh, okay, here's what I've got in my hand: a stopwatch. It's set for three minutes. Okay. Uh, that's how long I'm going to give myself to talk about my new Nintendo Switch with you. Ooh, okay. It started now. You mentioned Zelda Dungeon. I bought the Switch, and ostensibly it was for Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3, which is Switch exclusive and is a continuation of one of my favorite video game series. It's the only way I can get it. So I got a Switch, uh, but of course I got the killer app Breath of the Wild with it. And oh, yeah. It's been playing that a lot. Probably my favorite game uh, for the last long while. Oh, really? Okay, so you're liking it. Oh, my God. Well, I, I hate Linnell's, but otherwise, yeah, I love the game. <laughs> yeah, they like, basically destroy you in one hit early on there. I get nervous sometimes when people are like, <laughs> I, I played Breath of the Wild, because some, some people have not liked it. So Really? Like it, uh, uh, Zelda fans of the past, or just like coming in, coming in fresh? I think... I think mostly it's Zelda fans. It's definitely a okay. I wouldn't say it's totally contentious in the Zelda community, but I think any time when you have something that is doing something so new like that, uh, there's always going to be people who are like, "This is not like you know my Zelda of the past." Interesting. See, I'm not very good at it, and I just figure that it's people who have been playing. Because the last Zelda game I played, I think, is the original Game Boy Zelda. Oh, <laughs> yeah, uh, well, Link's just Awakening. in time. <laughs> the real Link's Awakening, yeah. Uh, so, like, my I, I'm not very good at uh, Breath of the Wild, and I just figured it was, like, a lack of competency with the controls that I've seen. You know, it looks like Twilight Princess, Shadow Sword. Like, these games look kind of like <laughs> Breath of the Wild in yeah. terms of their structure. So I just figure, well, you know, other people are probably doing better than I am. But the fact that, like, veteran players don't like it is is interesting. It 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 discarded a lot of uh, the trappings of, like, older Zelda games. Like, it's it's more open world. Like, it, with older Zelda games, you have a linear kind of story structure uh-huh. and stuff like that. You can still explore a lot. But this game went, what if we could do everything whenever you wanted? And, you know, it has its pros and cons and... Some people who just wanted a classic Zelda game were like, I, I don't know. I don't like this. Interesting. Well, yeah. I mean, it's right up my alley, and I really love it. Uh, I also picked up – oh, boy, I picked up a bunch of different games. Um, I got a uh, a Dynasty Warriors game. I got Warriors Orochi uh, okay. that I've been playing. And then on the Zelda tip, I'll probably be getting uh, Hyrule Warriors pretty soon. That's a pretty fun game, yeah. L- I'm loving the um, the online store, too. It's so convenient, and I've probably spent more than I should. Um, I like those sort of retro-esque games. So I got Streets of Rogue, which is a, uh, a rogue uh, you know, 8-bit platformer. Mm. Um I just got Celeste, which is uh, has been – I haven't played it yet, but uh, people have been talking about oh, yeah. it uh, as a real great game. And, yeah, it's a bright new Nintendo future for me. The Switch is so good for all those, like, little indie sort of games that, you know, are you can hearken back to this kind of old style, but they, they pack such a punch with them. They do, yeah. And I got it, my Switch, just in time because they had, the, of course, the um, uh, Nintendo console for NES games, but they just launched the SNES games. So I'm going to get to play Super Metroid. I never had a Super Nintendo as a kid, but I Metroid is one of my favorite uh, games and series. Now I just want them to get the um, uh, like Metroid Prime and get the 3D ones. Oh, that yeah. I think a lot of people are waiting on that. I would love to do that. All right. Well, uh, our audience need wait no longer through our <laughs> Nintendo talk. We did because it. Because <laughs> the uh, timer went off. Yeah, we cheated a little, but we got there. Uh, before we get to, today, to today's backtrack, we should probably talk about the news in the world of Star Trek. And we've got some weird, uh, kind of hard-to-parse news uh, relating to Star Trek Discovery. Uh, I don't know if you heard about the situation with Walter Mosley. Oh, I did the, uh, hear about that. Yeah. yeah, in the Discovery Writer's Room. Walter Mosley, uh, if you don't know, is a writer. Um, he, he's been described as a sci-fi writer. He's really not. I mean, he's more of just, uh, I think his primary output is um, like noir detective fiction um, if you remember the 1995 movie Devil in a Blue Dress, that mm. was uh, adapted from one of his um, films or his books, uh, the Easy Rollins uh, books. And he's also done a lot of other stuff. I mean, he's done um, 
like you know mystery books uh he has done some sci-fi he's written a couple plays like he's a very prolific guy and he uh was hired to be in the discovery writers room and without just like reading um you know like a press release or you know i'll just give you my summary of the story basically he was uh dismissed or asked to leave the writers room uh after somebody made a complaint with hr about him using um the n-word in sort of an anecdote that he was telling and i believe that the anecdote was about a like a situation with police a story from his life or a story just sort of right that he yeah. knew about yeah um that was sort of like racially charged and so he, uh, you know, left after that, and then he wrote like this big New York Times op-ed that was kind of scathing about the situation and saying like, you know, why can't I use that word? Because I'm you know, he is you know, African American, and um, yeah, so it's just yeah. a, it's a mess. It's a it's a it's a big mess. Yeah, and I do think that is kind of bogus, right? He's like he's a person of color talking about his experience. You know, I don't know. That seems kind of sketchy to me. Uh, I wouldn't say that the use of the N-word is the problem necessarily. Right. It's just like yeah. everybody's reaction to it is weird and self-serving, I think. Because the first thing – because he doesn't really have to be there. Like he's very successful. So the first thing that he does is like we don't know if he could have negotiated to stay or apologized. He just rage quits and then writes like an op-ed and then he comes off as like – you know his bona fides as like somebody who's edgy and is not going to like back down about the racial experience are totally you know solidified as far as he's concerned and then it totally discount because i've seen a lot of people being having like i've seen a lot of people having the opinion of everybody's just so you know thin skin these days it's like great well that's we need to hear a lot more of that because definitely not taking people's feelings into account is the way that we should go. The, the Discovery's writer's room is already a sort of tumultuous place because, like, two showrunners and, like, a major contributor to the show were all asked to leave because oh. they couldn't behave themselves, you know? Um, Berg and Harberts, the pre uh, previous showrunners on the show, were like abusing the staff basically just being very verbally abusive and if it staff had complaints they just told them like shut up and and uh and don't uh don't talk about it and so it was an hr complaint that got them out from under that so i i don't know you're like i don't know if it's a <laughs> i don't know if this is just like the culmination of other behavior by him you know i can't imagine him just saying one thing and then he's gone. But like, like I said, I will never get the whole story because CBS won't say anything. And of course, it's Mosley's business to write, and so he's written this New York Times uh, op-ed, which you can still find uh, online if you want to check it out. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You hear people all the time, uh, or see it. People complaining about like PC culture run amok, and you're like, uh, okay, that's what. What are you trying to say? How is that even but, possible? Like every cable <laughs> drama that exists, I'm seeing like explicit male and female genitalia, you know, in the first three minutes. Right. Like, we don't live in a we don't live in The Handmaid's Tale. Do you know what I mean? Like, I know. I, I, right. I think it's OK to to worry about people's feelings. I think that's I think that's cool. I think it's cool to be considerate. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. But, uh, and I'm, yeah. At the same time, like I, you know, if I was. I don't know. Like you said, you don't know the situation, but I feel like if I was in uh, this person's situation, I'd be like, um, okay, like I will quit, you know, <laughs> like this. this oh, he, well, yeah, yeah. And I'm not like cool with censorship, but like I am cool with people not coming to work and feeling uncomfortable about what's going to, what's going to happen next. Yeah. Well, uh, and although it's too bad that, I mean, I don't know what point that he was at in terms of the writing process that it's too bad that we won't get. Um, presumably like his, his input, uh, or his output, uh, into the show. But I, I'm also thinking, my thing's kind of like, why is this guy there? You know what I mean? <laughs> like he has better things to do. <laughs> yeah. Like you'd expect, you look back at like Star Trek, uh, like the next generation, for instance, and it's just like a bunch of, uh, young writers who turn out to be Iron Steve, Stephen Bear or Ronald E. Moore or Renee Echeverria or whatever. It's like, why is why is Michael Shaban running the Picard show? Why mm. is this guy uh, working on Discovery? Why are we pulling in this sort of like stunt stunt casting or stunt hiring in terms of the writers? Well, uh, do we not believe in the writers we've got? 
I think this is, oh, you're from their perspective. Because I was thinking from the people who are there, it's probably just like, well, this is like my retirement money or whatever. You know? Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, you're absolutely right <laughs> on that. Although I'd, I'd hope that Michael Shaben has, uh, I don't know if he's divorced or something, but I hope he's got something yeah. saved up after it, his Pulitzer Prize. It makes me think of how, you know, you get a, you get an Oscar and then you get to be in a Marvel movie and... <laughs> Yeah, set, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah. I just feel like on on the Discover or on the CBS side, they probably think it's a real great get, and they're not wrong. But you don't like, it, you know, Taxi didn't try to get J.R.R. Tolkien. Do you know what I mean? Like it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> it's like there are many, many, many screenwriters in Hollywood. Uh, many screenwriters contributed to the movie that we're going to talk about uh, today, and you know, it things turn out great. So I don't know why we need Walter Mosley. Yeah. Um yeah, that's that's a good question. Um back I mean back to the like the kind of ideas. Well, we like you said, we don't know what what happened, but I do feel like maybe this is something that you know is more worth a having a conversation about than I mean whatever. I guess if you're uncomfortable in your workplace, you're going to complain about it, but I I don't know. I I've seen before like times where uh people who are of of acting in good faith or they're you know they're uh, like people of color or something you know speaking their truth and people use like sort of like wokeness to like fa- fake wokeness i don't think the writers are but you know like to kind of like call these people out and and like stifle them you know what i mean yeah. Or like we've seen this is like like I said, I don't think anyone in the writers room is like an alt right person or whatever, but we <laughs> we do see that precedent being set of like alt right people feigning wokeness to like be like uh d- James Gunn bad or something, you know, just something like yeah. that where it's like let's James Gunn bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you. you're right Frankenstein. I don't know. I feel like this is just a weird situation in general cuz it doesn't it doesn't do anything to further a conversation about you know like this like his experience or like what using that word means or any of that stuff it's just like yeah and that word's been used on star trek yeah <laughs> so i don't yeah. know uh, yeah i don't know i guess we'll never know like you said because we weren't there but yeah and, but the sad thing is we'll never know because both sides decided to not make it a, a teaching moment you know like cbs didn't comment at all and then walter mosley made it sort of a, a stunt on his side so I don't know. I don't know. It's probably in no one's best interest, too. So. Yeah. Well, maybe, you know, maybe it's not too late. Maybe they can reverse it and he can rejoin the production and we can maybe have a conversation about it. So, I yeah. don't know. Let's hope. I mean, you mentioned the James Gunn thing. That seems to have mostly worked itself out. So. Yeah, totally. And I think a lot of people have more understanding about how these types of things work through that, that it's not just a you were a bad person and yeah <laughs> yes know. yeah do you, do you ever delete any tweets me yeah um you know sometimes i've uh looked and i'm like well, oh i said this in 2015 this is like like my wrestling opinion or something I'm like this is so stupid <laughs> and i'll delete it but I, yeah i don't i don't think i have any secret hidden tweets that i'm uh ashamed of but i i have to admit i after the i think the james gunn thing specifically i did go back through my stuff and it was the same thing like you know i don't remember ever being racist but just like james gunn's stuff you, you know you're younger and you're like oh, that's pretty funny and you look back and you're like that's not funny why don't i think that was funny i thought that, i thought that i was being edgy or cool or something like that and uh yeah i might have uh clipped one or two out of the feed sure there. yeah i i mean i i don't remember ever being a t- terrible person but i do back when you being... were in the clan uh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. my god Oh, and you know what? I also don't mean to, like, compare James Gunn's experience to, like, a person of color, like, talking about, you know, <laughs> no, oppression no. or whatever. I just, no, I just not. mean the whole idea in general of, like, yeah, yeah using that type of <laughs> but, stuff. <laughs> but that's our only perspective is just uh, two well-off white guys who are like, what did that guy in the hat <laughs> – what, what's he mad about? Yeah, so yeah. – Take take it as it is. That's that's what I hate about everybody's commentary, though, is that everybody has a voice, which is great, but everybody uses that voice it, it, not to say, like we have today, hey, let's talk about this and discuss it, is to go, here's what it is, period, end of sentence, moving on. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's either... It's all declarative. It's, yeah, it's very... 
black and white, I guess. Well, I think this is a great commercial for our Discord then, <laughs> because because we are uh, we're professing to want a conversation. Uh, join us then, uh, listeners, sure, yeah. in that conversation <laughs> on our Discord link in the show notes. Let's get to our featured subject for today's show. You know, a time loop would be a horrifying thing to live through, but at this point in history. Any sci-fi fan or maybe any film fan would probably be pretty well prepared for that experience. You know, it's a popular trope in film and TV. It appears not only in sci-fi properties, but even in dramatic and comedic vehicles starring Bill Murray, Jake Gyllenhaal, and Natasha Lyonne. But what if all you needed was to stay alive and to kill as many aliens as you can? Enter Edge of Tomorrow. What I am about to tell you sounds crazy. But you have to listen to me. Your very lives depend on it. This is not the end. You see, this isn't the first time. Now, we've had this conversation. What day is it? Judgment Day. You just came in with the fresh recruits. This is not the end. The invasion will fail along with every soldier you are sending. We lose this is not everything. The end. Come find me when you wake up. to you happened to me you hijacked their power i need your help with what exactly winning the war we can do this just come here every day and i'll train you this is not no matter what i do this is as far as you go why does it matter what happens to me? I'm not a soldier. Of course you're not. You're a weapon. Did you see Edge of Tomorrow uh, when it was in the theaters? Yes, I actually saw it like three times in theaters. Wow! Yeah. So you okay? So you really liked it? I did. And you this were the w- one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was kind of well. That's what's interesting was I was looking back. Uh, you know, this is my first time watching it since uh, a couple years ago when it came out. Yeah. And I, you know, so I was like, that I remember like it went through this whole weird thing where like. It, maybe people didn't like it like they were like trying to change the name or something to live die repeat yeah um so yeah. i looked it up and it's got like a, you know a 90 percent on it's Rotten very Tomatoes. well reviewed yeah yeah so, and of course um i don't look it depends on what you think about reviews I sure a show yeah. about that called craft services but like yeah as of right now it is looked on uh very favorably the problem is is that the box office wasn't uh, ah. Stellar. Uh, it cost about 150 million to make. It made about 100 million domestically, which is always bad. Although Tom Cruise always does well overseas, so it made about uh, 375 million, I think. So technically a success. Okay, that's what it was. <laughs> I was looking at the stats on BoxOfficeMojo.com because I'll tell you, I didn't see this in the theater. Wherever America was in 2014, I think I was in a similar place. I was like Tom Cruise fighting aliens. Uh, I don't think so. Not not really interested in that. And I guess I didn't really – and then I guess I heard that it was um, kind of Groundhog Day, uh, still not really swayed. And the movie did uh, – it didn't have an awesome opening. It, it made um, $40 million uh, opening on June 6th, 
2014. June 6th, of course, important as it's the uh, anniversary of the D-Day landings, which are referenced in this film yeah. all throughout. And it only made $40 million, which wasn't fantastic. But the next week, it didn't drop off all that much. It only dropped off 41% and then sort of continue to perform until it was basically just removed from theaters. You know, these days you don't get a lot of time to make an impact. So you're already sort of draining out of the theaters after a certain amount of time. And word of mouth was strong. And I remember I saw something else. I can't remember what it was uh, in that year, 2014, probably a Marvel movie. Uh, And as I was coming out, I went by the Edge of Tomorrow theater to sort of stick my head in and see, just to get a little taste of it. And it was a bad time to do it. It was probably the one kind of slow point near Uh. the end uh, when they're on the mission to the Louvre and it's like two of the goobers from J-Squad. So it was like two people I don't recognize just looking at a bunch of like waterlogged cars and I was like, this thing looks boring. And I just walked out and I never, I didn't end up seeing it until it was on home video. Kind of perfect that happened to be the one part. Yeah. But if I, yeah, any other part, and I probably would have seen it in the theater and loved it. But yeah, I just saw it on uh, probably Netflix or something like that. This this came at a specific time in my life where I had a lot of free time. Um, and I, <laughs> Do tell. I, I still, like, I go to the movies now about, like, once a week anyway, because yeah. I get that AMC stubs. <laughs> but uh, yeah. at this time, uh, I, I remember, I think it was the summer this came out, and I just, I wasn't doing a like a lot and I was just working and then kind of whatever in my free time and like about once a month or maybe once every month and a half I would if I had a day off I would just go to the movies uh early in the morning and just stay there all day (laughs) off of one ticket and just watch (laughs) uh I try to get like four movies in (laughs) and that would be like how I instead of going once a week I would just watch four movies in a day every month (laughs) That's, uh, that's cool. Yeah, oh, it was very cool. Is um, that wait? I mean, are you? Is that how the stubs thing works? It's just like no, your... no. That's what I do now, oh, so okay, I can go okay. to the movies like a normal person. Like you know, once a week, we'll be like, well, let's go to the movies, and you know, go okay. separate. But sure. at this time, it was I would buy a ticket with my with my hard earned money and be like, I'm getting the most out of this. And okay. No one seemed to care that I was Man. there all day. <laughs> I, I wish I had the courage to to do that. Uh, I even worked in a movie theater, so I know how easy it would be to just, if you just don't draw attention to yourself, yeah, you could just be there all day long. But, yeah, no one uh, actually cares. So, But I just feel too bad about doing it. But, but tell you what, I'm going to set a goal for myself. I'm going to do it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's worth I'm gonna steal. Shot, right? I'm going I'm to steal from AMC. Or whoever we've got around here. Oh, now you've committed it to record. Oh, there's crap. I don't think podcasts are uh, admissible, though, are they? Otherwise, the true crime podcast business oh, would have totally changed for. our justice system. Yeah. <laughs> but I, at the same time, I if a movie like uh, hit me at that at that time, I would be like, okay, I gotta I gotta go, convince someone to go. So I saw Edge of Tomorrow a lot. I saw Guardians of the Galaxy like multiple times too so yeah it was yeah. A good i remember that being a good year for me for movies uh i would have had to convince somebody to see a tom cruise film i think in yes. 2014 um because you know i was looking at tom cruise's career and trying to sort of get a feel of my own feelings for him which i think have vacillated like most of the countries but it's amazing i know that he's a huge star has been a star his entire life he can do whatever he wants but you look at his imdb uh page he's done like a film a year his entire career or at least since he became like a big deal like he's just done one film a year he must have his schedule set up that way and if he's done more than one a year it's just a little thing it's him playing you know handsome austin powers in the oh yeah like that yeah Or uh, Tropic Thunder, yeah. But he just does one film a year. So when he does a film, you know, it's something that he, I think, really believes in. Um, Absolutely, yeah. What do you, uh, what do you, what do you think about him? He is like seemingly probably a bad person. I think, <laughs> or like he's just like way too into Scientology and. Well, he... that's yeah, that's weird. I don't think he would ever use like the N word in a writer's room, for instance. But I, uh, I don't think that. I don't. I don't think he's a bad person. 
Uh, I just I, think he's in a weird cult. That's all. Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's that's it. I've just you know you hear stories and all this stuff, and it's like, yeah. Oh, I don't know what's going on here. But this was like my so like that was what I was going into this uh, back in 2014, and I was like, I don't you know whatever. I was but I was open to it, like I said, because it was just like my third movie of the day. Um, <laughs> but right. then I yeah, this kind of was. I was like, oh, I'm, b- I'm back on board. Uh, with the with the Tom Tom Cruise train here because <laughs> after this I I remember going to see uh, what was Jack it? Reacher, ja- I, you know Jack <laughs> Reacher yeah also quick Christopher McQuarrie right was it right yeah yeah and yeah. and that left me open to going with my friend to see Rogue Nation I think it was the Mission Impossible four or whatever I don't remember which one five. that was that's five five okay <laughs> and then like yeah. And then now I'm 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 back on board. Basically, this was <laughs> yeah. this was what started it, though. <laughs> I like to pretend that I'm like the king of the long bet in entertainment. Like I've been a fan of blank since blank. Uh, but I kind <laughs> yeah. of f that up with Tom Cruise because I definitely left the Tom Cruise train for a long time, and I stuck with him through Mission Impossible Two. Uh, <laughs> you know, on up to oh, that's a probably. Yeah, through Last Samurai up to I think War of the Worlds was like okay, I'm stepping off this this train here. I don't think this is uh, going to be a right. Thing. I think that's what I had associated him with at that point too, because I I wasn't really thinking a lot about like the early Mission Impossibles. Did, I didn't care about. I was maybe like kind of young, and they were seemed like too adult or something. I don't know. Well reviewed or poorly reviewed. Uh, or even like making money or not making money and a, and a flop for Tom Cruise is, you know, 10 times the box office of anybody else's film. Uh, he is, you know, an American institution. He is uh, definitely not going anywhere. And he's definitely not going anywhere being somebody who is he got to be in his like late 50s, right? He's he's up there at this point. Yes, I think he's like 56 or 57, something like that. Yeah. But still uh, chugging along, doing all his, own, all his own stunts as he did on this film. Uh, yeah, that that's one thing that uh, I think drew me to it too. Was like you really, uh, I I don't know actually if at the time I noticed it, but like I, you could really feel it. But now mm. now that's something like I always am noticing is like oh this seems different because he's actually there physically doing it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm sure he was doing it before, but I think this is like sort of the start of that being his his gimmick. Do you know what I mean? Um, this is also the first uh, movie of his, uh, you know, even though Warner Brothers considered it to be under be underperforming. Uh, it's his first movie since War of the Worlds to gross over $100 million uh, in the U.S. Uh, OK, so maybe, yeah, maybe this was uh, the start of everyone else's uh <laughs> trip back onto the train so just like the characters in the film i want with you to rewrite time uh, and make this movie a success or the success that it was because i feel like it has the reputation of being something of a failure and it clearly is not yeah but you know what i also i i think people just don't even talk about this movie not really no so the, I don't, the biggest I, story is that they keep trying to change the title <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're they're trying to do with the title uh what they do in the movie <laughs> yeah right yeah <laughs> um but yeah it's uh, weird because it's like people don't view it like well because on top of it we, we haven't even talked about how it's like an adaptation of a manga right yeah well but, let's talk, talk about that right now yeah sure it's <laughs> it is uh, it started as a manga uh 2009 it was published uh, it was called All You Need Is Kill is the title of the manga written by Hiroshi Sakurazaka. And it is very similar. Uh, have you read the manga? I haven't read it, no. I have read – I don't think I've finished it, but I've read um, multiple volumes of it. And, you know, th- the differences are just night and day in terms of what's a Western film and what is a, a Japanese manga. But apart from that, it's it's very similar and it's it's fairly faithful. Okay. So, yeah, so that goes back into, like, people not talking about it is, like, people don't talk about it, and they don't talk about it, like, the way they talk about other uh, manga, uh, video game, anime adaptations, where it's, like, people keep saying, like, they're never going to get these things right. They're never going to be able to (laughs) adapt these things. But, like, it seems like, and I haven't read the manga, so, you know, I don't know for sure, but it seems like they got it right. Like, they adapted a manga, and it's... 
it's solid. It's a solid movie. So I I don't know. It's just weird that you don't hear more about that. Yeah, I wonder – I guess we could do a study or something, but I wonder like about the success rate of adapting – manga to film as compared to other you know just comic books or even like you said video games uh or or whatever i think that the 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 role of storyboarding you know in film and now even tv today is uh more important than ever and i think that manga is so cinematically produced um as is that you can really just take you know the the literal manga and just look you know to build your sort of f- uh, film build your scenes that way and then you know in the case yeah yeah they they whitewashed it i guess but you know it's one thing to have a character that needs to explicitly be a different race and it's another thing to just you know re- reset it somewhere else Oh, I mean, yeah, since we're totally. since we're going hard on on race issues on this show, apparently, <laughs> uh, what do you think about that? I guess I just gave my view, which is, you know, if you want to set Pride and Prejudice in um, Meiji era Japan, I'm fine with that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's something you if if you're getting something interesting out of it, like I think that's totally um, interesting. I guess like it's worth it. Um, yeah. I, yeah, ScarJo I just got real excited because she thinks she's going to get another role here. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love when when you talk about her on uh, just enough trope. It's like <laughs> it's just a never ending situation. People seems. who speak, but she here's talking about people who might be bad people. People who <laughs> who are talk who aren't careful when they talk open themselves up to stuff. She might be like. Because clearly she she does work for charity or has in the past until she got fired. But like, she, you know, she could be the nicest person in the world. But then like, you know, let that extend to how you communicate. Because you, as a famous person with a mic in your face for your entire life, you shape other people's ideas. You know, when, when yeah, you go, absolutely. well, I don't care about representation and I can play a Japanese person. People whose brains are still, you know, soft cookies baking in the oven – Go, oh, I guess it doesn't, I guess representation doesn't matter. You know, the, people hear that. Right. And yeah, so as far as this movie goes, like, I feel like I, I don't think it really does do much for the movie to have other than like we got Tom Cruise in it, you know, so there's a name and, yeah. you know, you get a little bit more out of it, which is what they always say with these. So, like, I do, I do kind of agree, like, if that's a criticism of this, that it's like the, you know, it it didn't really do much for me. I mean, I guess setting it in Europe, you have kind of the the D Day parallels you were talking about, yeah, but yeah, it, yeah. it that didn't that didn't make or break the movie for me really. And I think I think it would have been more interesting, I think, to see uh, like just having you know uh, Asian actors in this would would to me make it feel a little bit more like. Um, unique i guess you know more so than like ah, it's tom cruise and like gears of war looking outfit you know (laughs) right yeah um the one thing that i like about the switch from the sort of manga setting to like a, a a war movie setting is that we get adult characters because you know in the typical manga fashion uh the characters are all like teenagers you know like oh right the main character keiji is uh is a young guy uh, Rita Vertasky is like literally like a 16 year old girl because she has to be because it's a manga. <laughs> and so like taking the great things about manga and then also maybe leaving at home the things that it's like, OK, well, what if it was played by adults, you know, who have like adult stakes in, a, in an adult war? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, yeah, it's the best of both worlds. There there could have been something interesting that though, too, because some something I was thinking about a lot more uh, in 2019 as opposed to when I was was in my early twenties watching this was like the, the world of this movie is actually kind of dark and like, kind like, like they, they punish a guy who doesn't want to fight in a war by like forcing him to go off and die, you know, like that's, yeah, that's kind of fucked up. And, uh, the, the Sergeant army character is, he's kind of that, uh, you know, the full metal jacket, type character but like we're supposed to think he's you know like fun and cool and not yeah (laughs) awful so like yeah i and and i was sort of thinking like well that's that's kind of that's kind of a cool 
thing like because then they they also do show <laughs> like the horror of it but then yeah. it's like they don't really like go anywhere like that's not a it's not a factor it's just more of a flavor but yeah maybe- there's a few storytelling shortcuts uh yes. in, in terms of like uh a tropey things i think mostly because we've got to do this over and over and over again yes. you know so yeah i yeah. think you can get away with it in this kind of thing too yeah but it would have been kind of cool if it's like and they make children fight, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, and you get that... Boy, I wonder if you could even get away with that today. Um, I'm thinking about something like... Uh, I can't remember the uh, director, but the um, Battle Royale um, uh, mm. d- Japanese movie that was an adaptation of the comic book, um, which was kind of controversial. And then the second one came out and was very controversial because it was about how terrorism is okay uh against certain governments and then it was like uh like released a week after 9-11 so that did not go well wow <laughs> but this is has no uh no complicated politics the aliens are here we need to kill them i also like the fact that um it also it takes place you know in a modern day you've got the whole um cl- clips at the beginning with uh cnn you see aaron burnett and mm-hmm. you see hillary clinton who I'm assuming they're saying is the president. <laughs> okay. Well, it seems like it, like they, they position her in these interviews in such a way that, to make me think that yeah. So guys, emails we didn't listen. <laughs> oh my god. But, yeah. This, <laughs> I mean the the world of this being set in our real world, and like also like having this kind of like I said the the shortcuts that make it darker than I think they really want you to think it is like yeah. it's it's really not that big I'm like that's you know not too far of a leap we kind of live yeah. in some some questionable times right now well, you know <laughs> well yeah and you know uh, what that like we would probably things probably you know d- despite the outcome of the election or whatever it's like I could totally see a uh a, a war machine <laughs> under anyone's uh uh what do you call it under any president you know we could see the same type of uh (laughs) militarized society no alpha you're the alpha yeah uh maybe (laughs) i i uh setting it in the modern day too i think makes it more real you know more more personable instead of flying around in cars so the only things you have to like hand wave are okay you know in five years we got a a, a, (laughs) a mech development team together so we've got like armored suits and we have holograms there's one there's one scene where we've got holograms yeah i know i think that's i think that's sweet though that it's like just it's like just off you know yeah and also i (laughs) we haven't talked about starship troopers on this show yet um i can see us doing it in the future for sure totally one of the things that people complained about like big Heinlein fans of the novel of that movie is that there was no mech suits. So I feel like a lot of the choices in this film, this is like, people call this like a Groundhog Day film. This is like a stealth Starship Troopers film. Because oh, yeah, I can see you've that. Got, yeah, you've got people in mech suits fighting aliens that arrived on Earth from a meteor. And you've got a sort of fascistic sort of, you know, give your life for, for the country to beat the bugs kind of situation. Yeah, you, be, you become the hero by, you know... Put it, you know, learning how to kill them and putting yourself, actually being brave and putting yourself on the yeah. front lines. Tom yeah. Cruise, you, 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 you're, you're a craven coward, but you literally should have no rights if you haven't like shed blood. <laughs> right. <you know? laughs> yeah, I want to talk about Brendan Gleeson, but let's keep putting it off. Let's talk instead about the radiant Emily Blunt, who I will try to speak about respectfully uh, in <laughs> this done. podcast. But uh, yeah, I really like her and i think one of the reasons that i really like her is this is uh, a great role for her and it's such a breakout role too i feel like before this she was just you know sidekick second hand in films like um the devil wears prada you mm. know um didn't uh have a lot of starring roles or a lot of roles that show a lot of range and she comes in and just you know kicks the ass of this thing and it's completely uh just completely believable as this total badass. Yeah, and it's like, you know, just as much of a lead as Tom Cruise, for sure. Yeah, I mean, she is... <laughs> Something that I read was that one of the reasons that uh, Doug Lehman, the director of this film, took it on is because he wanted to see Tom Cruise um, not be good at something, you know, be the incompetent. And I would argue that he okay. is... Yeah, you because know, in every movie that he's in, he's always he's the hotshot 
blank. Oh like, yeah, literally anything. Uh, he's a hotshot cocktail, you know, um, maker. He's a hotshot lawyer. He's a hotshot right. whatever. To the and, point where, like, they've written now, I think, into Mission Impossible, that, like, where it's like, there's something wrong with this guy. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, he's just, like, sociopathic in terms yeah, of, like... Yeah, he's, like, what so he's... obsessive, and, yeah. All right, but see, that that works as a character trait yes. in what will be an eight-film series at this point uh, in 2021. But, uh, but, yeah, but, like, a friend of mine, I see, this is part of me and my history of loving Tom Cruise. Like I loved him in high school and I always tried to get my best friend to go see Tom Cruise movies. And he's like, I don't want to see Tom Cruise movies. They're dumb. He comes in. He's the guy who's going to be the best at whatever it is. He just figured out like what it is and he's the best at it. And there's some dumb subplot where he's, Oh, let's have sex on this desk. Oh, the secret documents. Uh, we've got the answer. Uh, and I was like, you're wrong. And then of course, years and years after that, he's, becoming the best samurai <laughs> you just drop him <laughs> off in japan and he'll be a better samurai than anybody else and i was like oh boy i think my friend has a point uh, uh, you that's... lost that war too <laughs> yeah i lost that war big time uh i can't go back and change that but <laughs> doug lehman's wrong because this whole movie is about tom cruise becoming the best there is yeah i was thinking about how he's like uh, a character you're supposed to like kind of dislike and, and that's that's kind of how it partially worked as like a reintroduction to him yeah. for me too because i was like all right this is believable but even like, at the beginning he's the best pr guy like yeah, he's totally really good at that yeah <laughs> but like it doesn't take like once this starts happening to him like you're like okay like he's good now you know he's just gonna keep getting better and there there right. will be some you know downfall moments but it's it's just it's like playing a video game it's just like fun to watch him leveling up <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah uh i also like the fact that you know, he's got this power, but he still needs the expert. He still needs Rita to to become better. You know, and e even as the film goes on and goes into, like, its different sort of acts, they're total equals. She – he becomes more important because he's got the loop. But even then, like – and I feel like the love angle is a little forced in. But we get to the point where he thinks he can do this, but he doesn't want to – complete the mission because there's he knows there's no way to do it without her dying and so we that's where he sort of gets stuck in the middle part of the movie they keep going to the house and it becomes for him like he just likes taking a moment to have some coffee you know with this woman that he's you know grown fond of uh and he can't like let her die yeah yeah and, and it was like you said it was a little bit like I, what what I kind of liked about the love angle actually is that they like they didn't make you uh, sit through too much of it. Like th they establish in that coffee scene that like and like when they're going to that house, like yeah, they've been through this. Like the falling in love part actually has already happened. Yeah, that's <laughs> the great strength. Yeah, that's the great strength I think of this film in that it trusts the audience a lot. It knows that you've seen Groundhog Day, that you've watched Russian Doll on Netflix. I don't know how it would know that. That was in the future. Uh, but it knows <laughs> that you have a familiarity with this type of story. And so it goes, all right, we have to do that thing that's always a little bit tedious in these sort of time loop stories where we're going to have to do something over and over again for like the first 10 minutes or so. And it does that. Yeah. You take your medicine. You get through that. But then we get right to things like Tom Cruise is running down the beach and he gets crushed by a truck or something. And he's like, <laughs> oh, he wakes up. And then we get right back to that. They shot it in the same day. It's the same setup. You know what I mean? It's just take two. He doesn't get tr crushed by the truck. And we get we're like, oh, OK, we get it. We get it. And then like one of my favorite parts is the montage where they're trying to figure out how to get off the beach. So he and uh, Rita are fighting and then like. She'll die, and you see, see like, the sadness on his face. And then we cut to them, and they've got, like, a football grid, you know, with, like, X's and O's. And they're uh -huh. like, no, you got to go over there. got to go over there. And then they'll go off, and they'll die a couple more times. You come back. Now the football grid is, like, even more complicated, and there's, like, lines everywhere, and they're arguing with each other. Like, it's just such great storytelling. We get it. We buy the premise. And so it's like, let's just push this through and be funny, too. Like, because it could have been, like, you say it's very dark. There's, yeah, it is. I mean, there's a lot of dark, yeah. violent stuff, but there's this light tone that I think counterbalances that uh, throughout the film. Yes. I mean, it is all the stuff you're describing is uh, a perfect example, actually, of how, how you, you said on uh, Twitter the other day that this is like basically the best video game movie ever. Because, like, yeah. <laughs> video game. Video games sometimes don't concern themselves with that stuff, and P 
people look at it in a negative way or they have these like tones that are all, all over the place but like that's kind of what's like fun about them is that you can in one moment have this super intense uh you know moment of uh, emotional moment but then in the next scene you're like wiping out hundreds of of uh aliens and it's hilarious you know yeah tom cruise is speed running world war three He's speed running. Uh, he's he's trying new routes, which he's I he's doing like. all the strats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And they they have different types of challenges. Like they have you know some some dialogue trees. They have to they have to finesse their conversations. They have a stealth level. There's a driving level. It's yeah. got it all. It's he got also, it all. Yeah, he gets to that point too, where it's like he's at a save point making coffee, and he's like, I don't think I have enough ammo or health pots to get through this next part. So you do that thing where you go, all right, I'm gonna let my so-and-so character die and I'll just shotgun to the end and see what kind of ending I get. <laughs> and he turns out he got the false ending. So he's got to go back and, and do it. The you right got to replay it. Yeah. It, it, it does capture, like I get the same feeling watching it that I get when I'm playing like a, a game like Celeste or whatever, like a, a platformer game where it's like, I can't make these jumps right. It's so frustrating. Like I'm banging my head against the wall. Yeah. And then you just like have that moment where you nail it and you're like, yes, like, all right, on to the next level. <laughs> yeah. There's also the thing where if you're playing like, I'm going to be good in this role playing game and you're being a hero and maybe you save it yes. and go, what would happen if I drowned the baby? Uh, he's also got that in the part where he just kind of gives up and is like, I'm going to go to the bar. And he just drives in yeah. to, uh, to London. And I, I wanted – first of all, before we move on, I wanted to mention that Sakura Zaka um, did specifically get this idea, this inspiration from what we were talking about, video gaming, and having to sort of reset a game over and over until you find, like, the right strategy or the, or That's the right great. way through. Yeah. But – I want to talk about those old men in the pub and the idea of a theme in this film. Okay. Like, I like this movie, and as much as you like this movie, I'm not sure that it's really about anything. Like, other than aliens are scary, never give up, Emily Blunt looks fantastic doing yoga. Like, I don't really know what it's about, except for maybe the hint is in, like, that scene. Because you've got Tom Cruise... Uh, who is a coward at this point he's been brave just you know be out of self-preservation and then he literally goes in a movie that comes out on june 6th <laughs> in an invasion mm-hmm. of europe or they're invading uh, france uh and sits in a bar with a bunch of pensioners who are all talking about like their time in the war and they've got their hats on and stuff like that and they're like you're a coward and it's, so you know is that what it is it just like a war in in, in the way that like a war movie isn't necessarily about like Saving Private Ryan. I guess is about earning it, but there's also little stories there. Many war movies are just sort of like, yeah, war is hell. Is that what it is? Like, is it just saying war is tough and you gotta you gotta keep fighting? And sometimes it's aliens. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that ties back into to what I was talking about with the beginning, where like they, they the movie punishes him, and it you know it does feel good to see him get punished because he he like is convincing people of this war or whatever but that but it's like kind of this horrific thing and and it yeah, ends I, up... i'm scared too <laughs> yeah i wouldn't want to do that brendan gleason is he is he insane is that what we're supposed to get because I think so yeah i don't like okay nobody likes a coward but tom cruise is doing his job like he says he was an ad executive who was uh like J. Razzi or something like that, you know, when he's in school, a, a war breaks out and pretty much everybody of able body is is like uh, pressed into war. And so the role he's doing is, you know, being like a face for the war. If you took if you t- I'm sure like many of the generals, you know, uh, uh, high levels uh, have seen combat, but probably from behind a desk or probably in a bunker because they that's how it works, you know, that from the enlisted to the uh to the uh, officer corps, like, you're not down in the dirt. So the fact that Brendan Gleeson just takes this guy and says, get out there, <laughs> just do it, like, that's that's horrible. Like, he's, he's killing Tom Cruise. Yeah. He's committing so, murder, basically. So, yeah, when, I, when that scene started happening, I, I started thinking, okay, maybe this is, you know, maybe this is about uh, how awful these things are because you know you see everyone's so stoked to go into the war but then you watch them all get massacred you know the one guy has like, oh a yeah plane it's, land, it's horrible and it's horrifying yeah. it's a, that's an amazing scene too but then late you know then later it's like you have that scene at the bar you were talking about and you know tom, tom cruise does get 
get rewarded by the end for being brave. You know, he becomes this badass and he's got a, maybe yeah. a girlfriend, you know? So I'm like, uh, <laughs> maybe this is just kind of not a critique of anything. And it's just, you know, it just is what it is, I guess. It just turns into a Tom Cruise movie. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, even to the point of the, all the way up to the ending, the ending where he goes to talk to her, the very last shot. You know, a lot of movies have these have these endings where they leave it ambiguous and it's it's usually you know for a reason yeah uh because it's supposed to you know be thought provoking or something you know it's like oh does he talk to her or not or what's he say it's like nothing that happens there is interesting to me because i can see that i can see that it's also a movie that we've just been like face fucked by cgi and aliens for almost two (laughs) hours so it's at that point you just get the suggestion of something good you know, it reminds me, and it should, of Groundhog Day, uh, where Bill Murray woos Rita, uh, and he knows everything about her. So I just assume that they will have a connection after this, because she still knows that this is a thing. So yeah, the fact that, I, I guess the, the war is over, they announced like that morning or whatever, but the fact that he could just come up to her and say, your, your middle name's Rose, and you know what the deal is. And that doesn't mean that we are dating now or something like that, but they've at least know. have this shared experience. Yeah, yeah. To me, that's, it was that's... almost like the movie acknowledging, like this does this aspect doesn't matter. Like we don't actually need to like show you it because it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I think that that's that's the same kind of trusting the audience. I think storytelling that they've done. Oh, so, yeah. I also like the idea, and maybe this is going out on a limb, but. The sort of thing that you hear about with soldiers where it's like, you know, the experiences they have and coming home and and not knowing how to communicate those experiences to their friends and family and only really being able to, like, relate to um, other veterans, you know, when it comes to uh, the the wars that they've been in, the people they've lost and that sort of thing. And we have that on a magnified scale where Cruz, you know, joins the army, basically, and is with all these people who are veterans, but – you know, only Rita knows what he's experienced. You know, she's seen her friend die 300 times, you know, when she was in the Battle of Verdun or whatever, and she's sort of haunted by this sort of thing. And it's something that Cage um, learns to really identify with. And then Absolute, it also gets yeah. turned over as he's now experiencing the same thing, losing her over and over again. Yeah, yeah, that totally works. It, like, that's it, so, another trusting the audience, too. Like, yeah, she tells it, us that this happen to her and it's like we can feel that happening to him even though we don't have yeah. to see it a million times you know no and the huge reveal is the first time that we see it you know the first time that we i i love that scene where they're he, he's you know binding her arm and um he's gonna make her some coffee and he's like three sugars i'll get it and i love that realization where she's like shit we've been here before haven't we you motherfucker yeah. you're like you're not telling me this stuff and the movie just trusts you. Yeah, we don't yeah. have to go to that farmhouse 16 times, you know, before we get to that point. Like, now it becomes the 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 point of view character kind of shifts to her. And so now she's like the hero and she's realizing, like, what are you doing, weirdo? Well, it's also like, because with a lot of, not even movies with this premise, but there's a lot of movies where sometimes they show you a certain character's point of view, but then all you can, like, come away with it is, like, this this person's kind of weird, you know, like even yeah. even now people like think about Groundhog Day and they're like, this is kind of like m- maybe manipulative to like learn all this. About-. And I mean, the movie's kind of about that, too. Yeah. But you know what I mean? But it's but I think to put it in the shoes of the character who's experiencing it and being like, like, what are you you know, why? Why? Why haven't you told me this? Like it, it makes it so much more effective because it's like we're meant to feel with them you know yeah and what does it even mean if it all resets and it never happened what is there morality in your actions did bill murray like gaslight and like sleep with all those women date rape all those women (laughs) do you know what i mean like oh boy yeah (laughs) does that right and we'll we'll talk about that when we get to our uh our star trek episode too but i think it's funny that we're kind of like backtracking edge of tomorrow with groundhog day but i think that the (laughs) the inspiration is uh is clear uh and it's all recursive anyway as it should be on an episode like this yeah totally and but i do think i do think it would be easy to just uh, make a movie that's like, yeah, what if we did Groundhog Day, but this, and it'd be kind of 
lazy, but I think they yeah they yeah did the fact that they work. could yeah that the fact that they could make it fresh is uh is really an accomplishment I think um we didn't even <laughs> people know what this movie's about right it's too late to to give a uh, uh, a synopsis of oh. it but is there anything that you thought because we've been talking about how clean it is let's pick on it a little bit is there anything that you thought like didn't really work at all or you were like wait a minute how did they do that um oh kind of like i said before I, I wish like i feel like they could have explored more with the with the themes and it you know like it's it is like you said it's not really about or it's like not trying to be about something but i think that is kind of a weak element of it because it's yeah. like things are about things whether you want them to yeah. or not yeah but uh, i think that it's i don't think that it's insecure but i think it's aware of that of its lack of being about something a little bit because it definitely tries to slip things in like there's a fun scene where j squad is playing cards at the beginning and that becomes an indicator of how cage can you know try to tell them that he's going through this thing whether or not they believe him but there's a speech that goes along with it where Farrell doesn't like him playing cards because it suggests that they're not the masters of their own fate you know it suggests that they're just mm. gambling with their lives which of course is what you know the entire movie will be about in terms of what Cage goes through and it's like yeah but I mean that's not really like what the movie's about that's exact. just a, that's just that's not uh, Linda Hamilton uh, speaking of another, another Terminator actor Bill Paxton uh, that's not Linda Hamilton carving <laughs> no fate into a picnic table that's way more important to Terminator 2 than just the guy that's from Terminator 1 going example. don't gamble yeah actually terminator does all that and still has kind of this there's something more to it to think about i'm not 100 uh, percent on this but i think the um the one of the writers behind this um and of course Kristen mccrory uh did do a pass on this script um wanted to pitch this as a terminator movie that like john connor um at some point maybe in the future or the past would find himself trapped in a time loop where he's got to stop a terminator and he has to keep doing it over and over again I think that could have worked. You know, you just yeah. I think you just replaced yeah. them. That with... totally could have. Instead of just remaking the first movie over and over again. Uh, <laughs> <Sorry>. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's uh for another day too, probably. Yeah. Um yeah, and there's all these speeches about like being baptized in the fires of war <laughs> or something. Yeah. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's okay. that whole yeah, well speaking of another Bill Paxton movie, that's that whole uh, alien thing, you know, with a pwn. It's like day in the Marine Corps is like a day on the farm. I love I love the Corps. Yeah, that is so it is just like yeah, the movie it, it reminds me of Mission Impossible actually where it's it's very focused on a specific thing and you can draw larger themes out of it but it's it's mostly like well, isn't this a crazy situation, you know? Yeah, it is crazy. I mean the movie kind of especially in that opening sequence it, it seems like it's shaping up into be in, into being a regular war movie. You know, you've got all the different archetype so like the badass the funky black dude uh you know the the weirdo um they've got a lady in this that's fun uh and they mm. hit the beach and you're like oh it's just it's like a war movie and then they start they all dying get, they all get cuisinarded by these like wiggly cyborg things yeah yeah and i also i like the idea that like sure that's what you'd expect in like a bad you know b movie they'd all get wiped out uh and then the one hero would survive but i like the fact that he's kind of he's kind of like using groundhog day to make it a better movie like the guy getting crushed by the plane that's like one of those all right you know that's i guess that'll happen but he like saves that guy and he gets everybody off the beach and everybody's like wow this guy seems like he's doing pretty good like he's keeping them all from having these like dumb cliched deaths <laughs> yeah yeah and like they don't give them they do the the right way of having like all these goofy side characters is like they're kind of aware of it and they don't try to like give them too much you know too yeah. much story you know that yeah. bogs it down i think we're back to saying good stuff about it again though yeah okay well that's fine <laughs> do you have any do you have any negative dings against it or something like that um you know it's if it's time travel and it's alien blood related time travel uh well i'm already done i mean there's no real criticism that you can levy against it except <laughs> like how does any of it work you know what i mean like why does he wake up specifically on the day before because they keep talking their terminology is reset the day but he wakes up literally the day before now maybe it's not set to like sunrise and sunset but when he takes her to the uh, when they go to the farmhouse they're clearly like 24 hours past the day before so like if he just got in a rocket ship and fucked off to like mars would that be the quote-unquote day do you know what i mean would it would he die mm. of old age at at, at uh, 90 
and then wake up back on at, at Heathrow. I think like, so. Yeah. Okay. I I guess I yeah, I didn't really even the movie does a good job of like hiding that stuff or like not oh, making no, you think about it. Oh no, for sure. You know, yeah, they make the things that matter very explicit and the rest doesn't. Although I feel like there are specific shout outs though. There's one part where he remember the part where he rolls under the tire of the truck accidentally and gets killed? Yeah. Uh, you need like the reaction of people to sell that, but if people are reacting, that means that it doesn't just reset. Like he's making a new timeline every time. Like, does time keep going on in that? Oh, version? Yeah. well, they yeah, because they did have the reaction. Yeah. It I did me think of, about that. If there's one scene in Groundhog Day that raises the same question, where we see uh, Rita and Chris Elliott's character look at Phil's body in the morgue, and you're like, wait a minute. Are these all different timelines where Phil Connors has just killed himself like thousands of times? Right. That's, that's really dark. That also means that if that applies to this movie, there are thousands of timelines where Rita Vertasky gets court-martialed for just shooting a guy in the face. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that goes Why did back. she just shoot this guy in the face? <laughs> yeah, and then it's like, okay, so do the, the, does the one timeline where you're like, all right, I'm not going to save that guy from the plane crashing on him because I'm I'm in grumpy mode. Like. Yeah, right. That's the dark mode. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, well, you okay? That guy died. You know, <laughs> like you killed yeah. someone. I got to speed run this. I can't get any of the power ups. I just got to get right to the dam. Yeah, yeah. Probably best not to think about that. <laughs> yeah, there was that. Um, just a little. I think the movie could have gone harder on some of the things. Like I like the shortcut. It's very smart of meeting Noah Taylor for the first time. And he's like, how many fingers do I have? And then the next time we meet him, Tom Cruise has already met him a hundred times. So he's like, I'm so-and-so, you're so-and-so, you got two fingers. Look, we got to just get right to this. Like, <laughs> right. But I think that they could have done some more fun things with that. Um, I mean, there's a lot of like aliens to kill and it's really cool. But those I like those little kind of things. So I wish that... They had put a little more of those in. But then there's not much of a supporting cast. Like, they do go... Oh, also, um, there's a lot of really convenient stuff. Like, okay, so the guy, the the general who tries to murder Tom Cruise by sending him to war uh, is also the guy who has the stabby thing that's the prototype. Like, why would he have that in a safe in his office? Oh, uh, because uh, it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's the well, answer. <laughs> yeah, right. And it's also so they can go right there and get it. And we get that great scene where they're doing like the little dance, you know, the choreographed dance to get through the security because they've done this a hundred times. But it's also a way that they can be wounded and incapacitated so he can get a blood transfusion because if a mimic kills him, it's just going to you know shred him into bits. But if he crashes a car and gets shot in the leg, then the humans will give him blood and we can move on to the third act. Like I, I, I see the strings. Like I get why it's constructed that way. I think it's good construction, but it's like, you've got a movie where aliens are attacking a time traveler. We can do yeah. anything here. Why are we doing this? Totally. Well, that, that reminds me that one thing I appreciate about it is that it is relatively pretty short. It's like not a, it's not a long movie and I'm, no. I'm kind of glad it doesn't waste time like we were talking about. Yeah. I think it could have been short. I mean, action movies these days have to be a certain length, but I think it probably could have been just over 90 minutes cut, uh, cut, uh, Brendan Gleeson going back to Brendan Gleeson, um, cut some like kind of extraneous stuff. Cause there's, I know that it did go through rewrites and I think they started shooting without an ending, which is scary, especially when you've got a movie about time travel, but, um, mm. they, cast Jeremy Piven to play some kind of character in reshoots. Uh, but he got totally cut out of the film near the very end of the film. When Tom Cruise uh, walks up and is looking at the TV um, where they're announcing like the end of the war, uh, British actress, Laura Pulver can be seen in the crowd. Uh, she's somewhat famous. She played Irene Adler on Sherlock and she's been in some stuff. Oh, so she, okay, clearly yeah. she had a plot line that just got cut out. There's also a part where, you know, I thought it would be a big deal when he learns, um, Rita's middle name, Rose, because that seems like if it's something she's never told anybody, that's the ultimate cheat code, really, right? To go back to video games. If he walks up to her and she's like, does I have something on my, fa on my face? And he's like, your middle name is Rose. Let's do right. this. It's like, oh, shit, we're at level 12. I thought we were at level. Okay, so that she can take him right to Noah Taylor and we can get this thing going. I guess. Yeah, I guess but I that doesn't come back. he was doing that. Yeah. But, yeah. That, oh, you know what? That's another good way they show that they're they're getting closer without actually having to see it is like 
she we learn that she's been lying to him but yeah. then she tells him the truth like okay that's but he, great but yeah and tom cruise is who i would not i don't know I, I think he's an adequate actor but i think you get a great look from him in that he she is lying to him he knows and yeah. he's also he's also put up with her lying before do you know what i mean he's just kind of like it's your brother okay sure oh it's not your name okay fine like it's sort of she doesn't know it but she's part of a long term relationship with him <laughs> do you he's, know what i mean he's like, working those dialogue options well he's yeah i mean he's doing that from a video game side but it's also just sort of like if you've got like an inside joke or like a mock argument like with your significant other that you something you guys always do that's oh, he's yeah. he's doing that from that side from her side she's like He's being kind of weirdly fl- flirtatious and familiar, and I don't think I hate it, but I'm not sure what's going on. Yeah, yeah. It's good gaslighting. <laughs> oh, my God. Quote me. Yeah, Quote 2019, that. Caliban. <laughs> good gaslighting. It, it did make me wonder, like, what – when he's, like, telling her about her life, if, like, some of that is, like, just a lie to try and bait answers out of her, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think for sure. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Good stuff there. It's like when uh, Phil goes up to I think he goes up to Rita in the diner and he's like, "Oh, your favorite ice cream is Rocky Road," and she's like, "No, no, my favorite ice cream is mint chocolate chip." And then the next day he's like, "Can I get some of that mint chocolate oh, chip?" Exactly. Oh, that's my favorite. Yeah. I mean, that's the bad, the bad gaslighting. Um. Yeah. <laughs> the bad guy. So like. Um. Also, he, why he, isn't why isn't the Omega? Why doesn't it make like pants made out of alphas? If killing an alpha would ruin this whole thing where are all the alphas shouldn't the louvre just be ringed by alphas i don't know it would make the whole thing impossible for them to win they actually were considering doing a kind of more um darker ending where in their assault on the louvre somebody f's up and they do kill an alpha and so then they end up sort of reliving a thing from the omega's perspective like they have now they have to try to do this quickly and in a way where the omega can't um reset and learn learn that they're killing it but that's oh. that's kind of complicated yeah yeah then it's like then you got a whole nother half hour in there yeah <laughs> that's um yeah or like i don't know do they ever do they ever say anything about this but i i thought like yeah they lose the power when they get someone else's blood but it's like can they go kill another one of those guys and like pour their blood on their face again that'll be the sequel live die and repeat and repeat they should do um they should do where they have to really live this movie again. <laughs> okay. So they're going to have a sequel to the film. Aren't they cowards if it doesn't start and it's just Tom Cruise on a helicopter? That's how it has to start, right? Yeah, I think I I think if so. If you commit to it's it's like the whole why is the sequel to Now You See Me uh n- not called uh Now You Don't. Like, come on. You you have made an agreement here by by entering into this so yeah if the second movie uh live die repeat and repeat which it's not a great title if it doesn't start with tom cruise on a helicopter uh come on man yeah it's like i know maybe they don't want to do the obvious thing but do you think he has like rewind time prince of persia powers now (laughs) that'd be actually a better concept if if he could just like rewind a little bit you know that he's got all the omega blood now Oh yeah, that's. I mean, if they figured it out, then he should just be a master of of time. He should be a time lord. <laughs> okay. Oh, careful. Um, old Tom Cruise as the American Doctor Who. I can see it. Well, oh uh, boy, we've we've definitely, I think, covered uh, everything that can be covered. We've gone over this ground again and again, thousands of times. It feels like, and I think we finally got it right. So let's take a break for a word from our sponsor, and we'll be back with more backtracking. Your Honor, a courtroom is a crucible. In it, we burn away irrelevancies until we are left with a pure product, the truth, for all time. Oh, man, now, this is so later, intense. Data is on trial for his life. life. I know. This episode, The Measure of a Man, is based on the Supreme Court's Dred Scott decision of 1857. And every week on Backtracking, we take a look at the real-world events that inspired classic Star Trek episodes. Sorry. Shut up! Who are you? (laughs) We're the hosts of Backtracking. I'm Caliban. You will both be taken to the brig and from there to the nearest star base, where you will answer charges for what you have done. And I'm Gooey Fame. This is not a game! 
This is life and death. You, you can follow us on Twitter. Backtracking is available wherever you listen to podcasts. You go f*** yourself. All right, we are back, and it's time to talk about the Star Trek side of this equation, an episode that also uses the quote-unquote Groundhog Day formula to tell us a little extra about our characters. It's the Discovery episode, Magic to Make the Sanest Man Go Mad. Listen, the ship is in danger. We have been caught in a 30-minute time loop, and every second that you doubt me brings us all closer to death. Intruder alert. Shots fired. Want him locked down. Drive overload critical. Wait! Go, go, go! <laughs> Make yourselves at home. I have. Star Trek Discovery. New you are all caught up now in Discovery, huh? Yes, yeah. I was pretty close uh, by the time we had recorded last time, and then we had that little break, and I had all the time in the world to, to binge through the show. Many say, in fact, just about everybody I've talked to says that this is hands down the best episode, at least of season one. That was, I think I had texted you at that point, because I was like, this this stood out to me, because it, uh, yeah, it had a, you know, it had a more contained plot, even though it con- connected everything, and it was fun. And I was like, okay, this is what... This is makes me think of Star Trek a little bit more. Not that I don't appreciate doing something new, but I, I liked the throwback feeling. Yeah, it's funny. This is an episode that is so reliant, clearly, you know, on like previous time travel stories like Groundhog Day. But it itself, I think, contains so many references to previous episodes of Star Trek Um Big one, cause and effect, obviously. Um, the TNG yes. time loop episode, yeah. Uh, which, I mean, we could have easily had done Groundhog Day and then done a backtracking on cause and effect, which, I don't know, we might do in the future. But I wanted to do this because this episode takes place, or this episode was shot and aired after uh, Edge of Tomorrow. And I think we're we're making, our theme in this is that we're making the case that Edge of Tomorrow was a lot more influential than anybody really realized. And I think a lot of those elements um, come right into this episode. But you've got references to cause and effect. You've got, um, I felt like the space whale was kind of a reference to um, Tin Man or Tin Man from uh, TNG uh, having like an organic ship. And mm, yes. having um, Mud, of course, is a reference in himself. Him wearing uh, Andorian armor, uh, you know, the Donnie Darko helmet. Um, <laughs> right. Like the, the whole thing is there's references um, and like Easter eggs in all of Discovery, but they just seem so explicit in this episode, which takes a break from the very 21st century um, chapter based ongoing Star Trek uh, storytelling to be a standalone episode that just, yeah, feels like an episode from an earlier series. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's standalone. But like you said, it's got all these connections and and kind of similar Edge of Tomorrow where it it just it's not worried about what you know. Uh, it just trusts you. Yeah. Uh, but it's never, Although- <laughs> you could watch this and kind of not know anything about it and still enjoy it, though, I think. There's a, a bit of a trade-off if we're just going to skip right to comparing these two. I would say that I think Edge of Tomorrow, though longer, has less tedium. Like, it has that thing that I told you where we always have to... Like, if you go back and watch Cause and Effect, the TNG episode now, which was, I don't know, late 80s, early 90s, maybe, um, it's pretty tedious. You get to, like, the fourth commercial break, and they're playing the poker game again, and you're like... I don't feel like we've, like, I I get that they're learning that they're in this thing, but I don't feel entertained, like, as an audience member uh, until uh, Kelsey Grammer comes out of that wormhole. Uh, (laughs) Well, how could you not? Yeah. And at Edge of Tomorrow, they immediately give us these little bits. The the first day, yeah. Yeah. And right away, Tom Cruise is like, there's a dead man in it. You know what I mean? Like, where he's already finishing the sentences, sandwiches, uh, and he's... Uh, it, it it builds, like the premise starts to evolve. This is like, you get a little bit of that tediousness in that they start the day and they do the whale a couple times, but I feel like there is more heart in this episode than there is in Edge of Tomorrow. Edge of Tomorrow is like, don't be a coward, check out Emily Blunt, she's doing, sure. you know, dive bomber push-ups. This is like, at this point, we have this character, Michael Burnham, who is completely cut off from the entire galaxy. Everybody hates her, because she's a mutineer. She 
personally um, went through tragedy as a child, was raised by Vulcans, and has no idea what to do with her emotions. And we've got, you know, Clem Fa- sexy Clem Fandango is on board and she <laughs> likes him and doesn't know how to talk to him. And this could just, we could just do this forever. Like her life could be miserable and we keep fighting this war. And yet this ridiculous, insane thing happens where this crazy guy in a bunny helmet keeps blowing up the ship. And the key to get out of it, the answer is emotional openness from her. It's her telling Stamets this secret, you know, and just taking a moment to connect with him. And even at the end, it's them You know, it's basically them like being vulnerable and letting Mud get what he wants so that they can uh, surreptitiously, you know, take things away and change change the the rules of the game. Like if everybody just was trying to be tough and two fisted and stop it uh, Mud the old fashioned way, it would just it would never work. But it's the fact that she's able to to admit to herself that she has never loved anybody and she is in love with Tyler and that's kind of what gets them out of it. Yeah, and like they get to a point where it's like they possibly could win, but she's got to she wants to like do it again to save him, Tyler. Too. Right, so yeah. It's yeah, it's not just about beating him, it's about saving someone you are you care about. Yeah, and that's the best ending too because that's the one where nobody dies, which leads me to the more moral issue that we mentioned before. Harry Mudd is many things, but I don't think of him as a mass murderer, and yet he kills a lot of people. <laughs> I think that I saw – he says 53 times he's killed uh, Lorca, and then after he says that, he goes on to do it three more. So 56 times he kills Lorca, and presumably yes. the entire crew of the uh, Discovery, excuse me, um, which makes him thousands of times over like a murderer, and yet – I don't ever get the feeling that he wanted it to be that way. In fact, we we see him do the same thing that Cruz and uh, Blunt do when they do their little dance, you know, in the in the building. He's trying to get it right, like he did the um, Beta Z. I, I assume, like the first time he tried to rob the Beta Z bank, I bet a lot of Beta Zs died. But the last time he got in and out and got his jewels or whatever, and like nobody was the wiser. Like that's his ultimate goal is to speed run it you know without having to uh kill anybody but yeah, and on the pro- way he kills a lot of people yeah that's that's interesting he must not view it it <laughs> i wonder if he is in this world like resetting time though probably you know they're like creating these timelines like that's gotta be something he's thinking about right <laughs> well we do i think we've got timelines or the concept of like separate timelines in in star trek right isn't um Vo- you know, Harry Kim comes from an alternate timeline in, in that Voyager episode. Um, but we don't have the scene where, you know, the Enterprise or sorry, Enterprise, I'm thinking of cause and effect. The Discovery <laughs> blows up and then another ship's like, oh, that's, that's tough. Like we don't ever have an outside perspective. We're only ever trapped on Discovery as all this is happening. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I think they also they just present it in such a more. Like the scene where he's killing Lorca over and over. It's so it's a, yeah, fun it's that you're like scene. not thinking about it. Yeah. And it's so smart because they could have just done a bunch of cuts. Um, but say what you will about the new sort of flashy, uh, say your daddy's Star Trek look of Discovery. Uh, that's that's the best way to use it, I think. That sequence where he – it's the same mud, but it's presumably different you know, timelines and iterations as he just keeps turning around and he'll kill a guy, spin around kill him again you know walk over here kill him again yeah that's that was just really great Mm -hmm. yeah they revel in it a bit which is (laughs) so it kind of takes the edge off but i i did have that same feeling watching it like you know like uh, is harry mud this kind of guy i don't know (laughs) i guess so yeah yeah um i like the fact that uh we're seeing a new aspect to the character of Stamets uh, in this. Uh, As somebody who has now completed the first season of Discovery, I guess you can give me your own personal opinion on the arc uh, or just the way that um, the Discovery draws the character of Stamets, but I I like this Stamets. You know, we... Yes. As we encounter him, he's been a real grouch, you know, up until the point that he does this, uh, you know, tardigrade DNA transfer 
And we immediately see like, oh, he's like goofy fun, Stamets. That'll be interesting to live through <laughs> in this show. But it immediately switches to, I wanted to be goofy fun, Stamets, but I've been through you know, 57 times the ship's blown up. And so I don't have time for that. I've got to, I've got to reach out in a different way. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? That does help eliminate some of the tedium you were talking about is we, we have a character who knows what's going on. So that's kind of nice. But uh, as far as his characterization, it was like partially what makes this episode stick out when I was watching in order going through was, okay, this is like, there's more to some of the characters yeah. Like him included, and he goes through a lot of changes even beyond this. Um, but he's actually one of the more interesting characters to me, b- sort of because of all that he goes through, I guess. So I think it's neat that even though he's not like our POV character, that would be Burnham, he's the guy that we chart the progression of this through. Like when you watch uh, Edge of Tomorrow, you know, Tom Cruise goes from a coward to a stone cold badass. And we know where we are in the story, but we're following Michael Burnham and she is Michael Burnham. She's the same every time. But we, you know, the next time we see Stamets, he's not as happy. You know, he's more frustrated. Yeah. Now he knows that, oh, okay, emotionally, that's how I can reach Burnham is not by yelling at her, is by just saying, look, you know, this is this is important. I thought it was cool to, like, not have it be from his perspective, but it did make for me the moment where he sort of gives up the ship kind of like wait what why why would you do that you know yeah yeah um that that's kind of a for me was like a major like okay this is this is kind of weak but i I get that you could have that but like i feel like it wasn't fully like convincing to me yeah there's a little thing too in this where and you just get this in you know you like all distances in space sci-fi get shorter like the longer a movie or a franchise goes on. Yes, <laughs> You'll have a thing yeah. where it takes a long time to get somewhere, but like at the end of Star Trek six and don't get me wrong. I love the end of Star Trek six, but Sulu goes like halfway across the galaxy in a matter of minutes <laughs> just to, right. to save the enterprise. And we got that in this, like, how, so the muds are just like one phone call away. <laughs> We've established firmly that this time loop is only, you know, a half an hour long or something like that. And so even if the second it started again, Stamets ran out, called one nine hundred, you know, by arms or something, and uh, contacted um, Stella and her dad. That they can just fly right there in like a half an hour. Yeah, that stuck out to me too. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in this that I was thinking, like, yeah, this is a fun episode, and that's why it sticks out. But I was like, to me, it's, uh, it's like, I don't know, it's, it's fun because it is referencing Star Trek and stuff. But to me, it is, it is sort of a like an okay version of, of like cause and effect or something. Yeah. I I don't mean to come, I don't want to be too negative about it because I I know there's, you know, people have different feelings about discovery, but I was like, this is a standout episode of discovery, but also because it's like an okay Star Trek episode or like pretty good Star Trek episode. Yeah. It's weird too. Uh, You know, people don't want to take their medicine. Um, Maybe the medicine shouldn't be prescribed. What am I getting at? The point is, is that I think it's funny that people think that this is one of the best episodes, specifically because it's the least discovery of all the episodes. And I think that's I think that's telling and it's slightly disappointing. Um, but I think that, I don't know, like for all the good work uh, in the, like the writing and the production and definitely the acting that's gone into Discovery, they have a way that they want to go. And I think maybe they could listen a little bit to the fans in that they really liked this episode that was a was a break it was a breather and it was a self-contained story because of course they immediately launched into season two with its long uh, red angel arc and we got farther away from one-shot stories than we than we'd ever been yeah i think after so many years of 44 minutes and everybody laughs and the credits come up um now that we got, you know, people look at something like DS9 and they think, oh, the best parts were the ongoing, you know, what it was just like eight episodes in a row, one long story. And now that we finally got the chance, we're going to go the whole way with it. Everything's going to be just one long story. And I think people are missing just, no, what if they just go to a weird planet? Yes, I totally agree. And I am, I'm, will admit that I'm like 
I was like part of that thinking too. Like when I first watched Deep Space Nine, it was you know in on my Netflix binges back when that was was the <laughs> when you had more free the time. New thing. Yeah, yeah, when I had all the free time, and yeah. I remember like I loved like Breaking Bad or you know stuff like that, and I was like. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it'd be cool if they brought back Star Trek, but they had it, you know, these cool ongoing stories like this. But now I'm real like realizing like I don't like shows like that. Huh. Um I'll, like there are some show like I don't know. I don't like these kind of like meandering stories as much like I I do like think there needs to be some like finality to them a little bit and yeah. I, and I think it's I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of a weird long game to play. Like there's, there's got to be a middle ground. Like Deep there, Space Nine does it. But Deep Space Nine does it. Yeah, it, it reaches that middle ground. There is. It's it's a weird sort of balance because Star Trek is really like it's kind of like an anthology when you think about it. Like it's easier to cover a lot of ground and tell a lot of different stories and make a lot of different points about um, about life when you can go to different planets and you're experiencing different things. This is the only episode. Or at least it's the first episode of Discovery that doesn't have any Klingons in it because they're not doing that ongoing story. And so I think it's cool to tell, you know, like you said, like Breaking Bad, like a long running story. But if the point of Star Trek has always been to show diversity and to show a lot of different people doing a lot of different things, if you're not going to a new place every week or at least looking at a new aspect of your world every week, you're going to lose that. And I think that that's what people are missing when they watch Discovery. Yeah, I, I mean, I was even noticing there would be some mini arcs in in both seasons, in season two also, yeah. uh, that would happen to specific characters over the course of, like, three episodes. Yeah. But I would think, like, why couldn't those little parts just be their own episode? You know, like, why did I have yeah, to watch? Yeah, yeah. Why did I have to watch three movies at the same time, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, but, the, you know, even that, though, is is more work than they ever did on the original shows. You know, you just, you're heading along and then suddenly, oh, George Kirk is Jim Kirk's brother and he's dead. It's like, what? Or like, oh, yeah, jordy has got a mom <laughs> and she's she was uh, in Starfleet. You know, oh, you yeah. didn't know about that? Yeah, so... I mean, That's I think fair, yeah. they are doing more of the groundwork in terms of trying to build up our characters, which we get in this episode with Random Communications Officer Man. I feel like Random Communications Officer Man, <laughs> uh, the line by Pike when yes. uh, Bryce, the character of Bryce, steps up to confront him. I think that was the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of, OK, look, let's just fill out some of these characters. You know, a that lot of people. sums up. Sulu is somebody's favorite character, and he was not a main character on the original show, and he only got like a couple good lines, but people like the side characters. And so, you know, the first episode of season two, Pike's like, all right, what do you do? Oh, I'm the communication officer. No, no, I want your name. Like, who are you? Tell me who you are. And we go all the way around the bridge, and everybody introduces themselves, because that's an important part, I think, of this show. Mm -hmm. Even if they're never going to have their name above the credits, if they're never going to be like a counselor Troy or a war for somebody that's important. Like we want to know who these people are. And we, I think that starts here. I still think though, like, like I liked that moment in the beginning of season two where it's like, yes, all right, we got these people. And, but then I was also, I was like, okay, we're going to get some, like maybe some episodes about these people. But then like, you know, that didn't really happen. And I feel like I didn't learn more about the people other than like they're hearing their names, you know? Yeah. The, well, the, um, we got to, <laughs> <laughs> we got to bring Jojo back. We got to uh, introduce exactly, uh, yeah. uh, Doctor Burnham. Uh, we got a lot of lot of stuff to do. So they, they went to they had Leland. an episode about the one uh, like cyborg girl, but then spoilers like they killed her and everyone was sad about it. But I was like, who is this person? You know? And it's so telling too that yeah, the the episode that she dies, we open on. Oh, hi, I'm a cyborg girl. Here's my whole life. It's like, oh, great. Oh, boy, this is bad, isn't it? She, we're gonna, she's going to die. I was, Yeah, I, I guess I didn't think that, though. It should be obvious. I was thinking, like, oh, cool. Like, we're getting an episode about this cool-looking character. But it's, yeah, it was, I don't know. <laughs> but I think season three, this is what, like, we're, we've done it all. We're we're away from some of these characters. No distractions, right. Yeah, we're going to find yeah. out who these people are. Yeah, I want to know more about the the what's her name with the the face uh, plate on her face. She's cool. I want to know about her. <laughs> They're on a camping trip in the future, and we're gonna stop stop being nice and start being real. <laughs> yes, 
Oh, boy. Well, I think we've uh, done a pretty good job. Anything else about this episode uh, that you wanted to uh, bring up? I mean, even I did want to say, like, even now I'm still like, uh, I'm not fully on board with any like character (laughs) in this show yet. And going back to watch this, like, still solidified that. Like, I did like the idea we were talking about of, uh, you know, admitting that she's never been in love and that kind of being the core to it. But like, I guess I... I was like, I want to know more about what that means to her specifically that she's never been in love. Like, yeah. does that mean like she she does in this? It, it turns out it just means like she's never been in a relationship or something like that. But I, I don't know. It seems like such a profound statement to me that I wanted yeah. that explored. But then I thought about where the story goes with yeah. her and Tyler, and it it doesn't interest me really. So. I think that I I agree with you in spirit. I disagree in this particular instance because I think that along with the sort of clipped, um, uh, sped up, uh, trusting storytelling that they're doing, I got like immediately that that meant – that was like the signifier, the signpost of her isolation and loneliness was all sort of concentrated. Totally. Yeah, I can, I can see that too. She's, she was loveless. But I do think a lot of the character we st- haven't hit that point in discovery yet where the characters are just characters. <laughs> what I mean is like I think the characters are defined by what they need to do at that time in the story. And a great example I think is Dr. Culber, who I really want to like, but acts differently every time he comes on screen because he needs to be th- the worried partner. He needs to be the doctor who's telling you we can't do this. He needs to be like, he's starting in season two. He begins to get character, but now his character is just, I'm mad that I used to be dead and now I'm alive again. And I don't know what's going on. And you don't have the thing like in TNG where I could say, waiting in line at the DMV go and you could go, here's how Picard would react. Here's how, you know, you know how every character would react. We don't have that in discovery because every character is still just reacting to the needs of the story at the moment. And I hope yeah. that um, as we go on, we can see, you know, that that improve. Yeah. And I yeah. So I'm I'm not trying to like totally dig on it because I know it's like that comes with time and they're they're the building blocks are there. And it's been it's been a fun watch so far, too. So, like, yeah, I'm I'm on board for for season three. Yeah. Um, more slow motion push ups. That's that's what I want. No, I don't know. Um <laughs> Well, yeah. let's uh, let's talk about the technology of Trek because oh, right. that's what makes Trek Trek. The technology uh, it facilitates the story and sometimes facilitates uh, our characters' lives, but just as often it could be a complication. So we're going to pick randomly from our list of Star Trek technologies uh, in a technology exchange, taking away some technology from Trek and adding it to the world of Edge of Tomorrow and seeing how that changes both stories. As always, we have to remind people what our list of technologies is. Our 10-item list of technologies is phasers, holodecks, tricorders, transporters, warp drives, replicators, communicators, shields, the advanced medical technology experienced by our Trek uh, heroes, and androids. And I'm going to roll my real-life practical die. And the answer or the number I got was 8 which means shields. How would okay. shields change the world of Edge of Tomorrow? I mean, <laughs> I guess that would be a pretty big game changer. They've got some of the some future tech, but yeah, uh, yeah, shield shields. It depends on who had them, you know. There's a big thing in the manga that the mimics uh, can only be killed by like this um, weapon that they have. That's like a stake thrower. It's like a it's like a gun that shoots like these big rods that can pierce their um, flesh and you only get like 20 shots. The, the, the ammo is so big, you can only hold so many. Oh, okay. And so one of the reasons that Rita and later um, uh, Kaji uses a um, uh, a bladed weapon is because you never run out of bullets. Oh, yeah. And we didn't even talk about that, that cloud strife sword. That yeah, was awesome. Which is, I think, is supposed to be part of a helicopter rotor. Ooh, okay. Because it's got like it has that shape and the sort of color of the metal, and then it's got like um like some kind of number, like a part number on it. It looked good. That looked pretty iconic. I'll say. Yeah, very very anime. Yeah. But yeah, well, shields. Yeah, you know, shields. Shields can make a big difference. You could you could have this whole other sequence of trying to infiltrate the the dam or whatever, but you got to bypass the shields. 
Yeah, but also like our heroes having shields. The big difference between the humans and the mimics is that humans, even if they have an armor, are just like these, you know, chewy, fleshy things. They just and, run over them. Yeah, and when you fight the mimics, they're just may they must have some organic parts, but they're like techno organic. They're just every part of them is armor and a weapon um I, I read in some of the design documents like when they came up with it they wanted to give them this idea of being made of like obsidian or glass like every part of them was oh. a, a weapon it was damaging was sharp so when you take a little gumby human and you throw him up against you know a three-dimensional <laughs> cuisinart like it's yeah bad news but having shields could could mean that like a human soldier could last more than a second against a mimic they go sword and shield against them that'd be kind of cool yeah which is you know kind of what that's Rita <laughs> and uh later uh cage's power basically is the ability to i like the fact that they're so good at it that yeah it's wounded but cage can just pick up a, an, an axe like a wood chopping axe and it's like all right i'm gonna take this one out and just chop it in the yeah uh, in the right spot a couple times that design of them actually is very video gamey too, because they are they're kind of a bullet sponge. Like they'll eventually die, but you gotta unload in them. Yeah. And it's and it's one of those things where it's like, no matter what the enemy is, like it, even if you just touch them, you take damage. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they, they don't have to attack. You Start just flashing. Touch them. Turn red. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's great. So yeah, I think that could definitely uh, keep the humans alive a little longer. I mean, we didn't even talk about like the last sequence where they go to uh, their suicide run to the Louvre. Like, mm, I thought yeah. that was pretty great. You know, I thought that some of the um, some of the J Squad like went out a little bitchy, <laughs> but at the same time, we haven't been spending the movie with them. There are those weirdos that we saw at the beginning, and we come back to them at the end. It so turns like, out they're weirdos. <laughs> yeah, and they are weirdos. And, and so it's not like we have a lot of connection to them. But there was a couple good, like, kind of deaths and moments. There was that, like, Aliens Vasquez moment where the one guy's like, no, nah, I'm not leaving. I'm staying here with you. And we're going to blow ourselves up together. I also liked when um, <laughs> there's a new trope now because <laughs> the old trope was black guy dies first, right? So the new self-reflective trope is black guy lasts either to the end or is the last like non-main character to die. Uh huh. Have you noticed that in movies? Yeah, yeah. Where it's like they're all, they're they're trying to make up for it. Yeah, which is fine. I want let's do another five years of that, but then let's just after that go to like roulette, <laughs> like just you know, uh, people could die at any time. But yeah. uh, once that character dies, like Cage jumps into the uh, the turret thing and then it slides out and he's like hanging from the wing as the plane which is now like a boat basically is like going over the water and he's just like swinging back and forth and like unloading on these guys like that was that's pretty cool. that was a video game moment yeah and you know what they were it had that moment where i was like oh boy they're on, he's on his last life <laughs> yeah yeah right his, his final yeah. guy <laughs> this this one really counts yeah no more continues well, okay, uh, I think that's pretty self-evident. If we took shields away oh, from uh, magic to make the sanest man go mad, uh, which is a quote from the Iliad, yeah, would that change things? And I think the first thing I can think of is, yeah, we've got a ship that's stuffed inside of a whale, which is just uh, just color at this point. Like, it doesn't have anything to do with anything. It's just, I guess it's just a way for him to get on board. But something that he does continually is uses the ship's own internal security fields to protect himself from just getting his head blown off. And without those, it would be a real different proposition for how Mud takes the ship over. Those were very convenient, too. It would be like, they're always set up, It basically. He had, like, a shield barrier constantly. Yeah, but not not invulnerable. You know, there's one no, part no. where either just through chance or because he knows um, the, the the pattern of things, uh, Stamets is able to get behind it and uh, and shoot him in engineering. Yeah, so that that immediately came to mind. It's uh, that would be a game changer. It would be it would be over for him really if they didn't have shields. That or he'd have to go. Maybe um, maybe the rabbit armor has some kind of defense um, in it, um, or he'd have to just. It'd be, a, it'd be a bloodbath. I mean, he would just have to, <laughs> instead of learning to walk through the corridor after the girl goes by, he, he would just like, how do I go through and like, I'm doing an all kill level. Like, yeah. how do or, I kill? Or I guess perfect, perfect dark, perfect stealth, you know? Yeah. Well, well yeah, yeah, that, that too. But yeah, but if he screws up, then yeah, he's totally screwed. Yeah. It would be a lot. It, instead of 56, it would be like 56,000 attempts to get through this thing. <laughs> Which it would probably still suck to die that much. I think that for him, 
he's just that determined, you know? He has yeah. this, like, the insanity of, like, anger at being betrayed by Lorca. Yeah, and- no, he plays it so <laughs> believably. So Yeah, it's, we it's didn't perfect. even talk about it. What do you think about Rain Wilson as Mud? We didn't even talk about it. I think he's, like, well, I was just saying, like, I didn't care about a lot of the characters. Like, I think he's the best character in Discovery. <laughs> he's in, like, one episode. He's just so fun, I think. Yeah, I was talking with um, a, uh artist um, named Mike Collins, uh, for another episode about this show and uh, of magic to make the same man go mad. And he pointed out to counter my thing about um, Burnham's openness and love being the key is that he really represents the opposite side of that. He comes in and, and does all this and claims loudly to anyone that will hear that it's all about his love for Stella and losing her. But when in truth, he has very little, if any, affection for her at all, and being remanded to her custody is like <laughs> the worst kind of punishment at the end of the episode for him. So he kind of represents like Burnham's opposite number in this. That yeah. is um, no offense to Discovery. Uh, it's an exciting show, but that is more subtlety than I would normally uh, ascribe to the writing on Discovery. Yeah, that I, I would agree with that. For sure. What do you think of the uh, the little uh, purple uh, gobstoppers that they eat and then they <laughs> dissolve from the inside? Those are pretty cool. I thought especially <laughs> the scene where she ate one looked so sweet. I oh, you it was see like... it go down her esophagus? Yeah, into her stomach? Yeah. <laughs> and she just has this like amazing look of like, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good. Gotcha, Even bitch. though I imagine that would be hor- horrible. That would feel horrible. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> they do. He sells it as the most painful way to die. And then two people die and it doesn't look fun, but they're not like, ah, ah, like you think they would be just, you know, they're, they're just completely out of their minds with agony. But yeah, it's uh, I wouldn't want to die that way. Yeah. Very. That was a good, that's, that's like the benefit of, or like what I think you were saying earlier, like modern, this modern Star Trek is, is very cool at like showing some of these like wild space concepts, you know, stuff looks awesome, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I also like the fact that, and it, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with his, what we learn later, his ultimate goal um, to, you know, get back to the mirror universe. But like Lorca is pretty much over this entire episode up until the oh, point. Oh yeah. That, yeah. I don't give a point, damn. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he doesn't care about the whale. He doesn't care about anything. He's just like, whatever. Uh, and then, you know, until the very last part where they get a chance to to trick mud. And I'm I'm amazed, Gooey, as a music guy, that you didn't call out the use of the Fugees yes. trying to stay alive. I in the forgot party about scene. that. I did want to talk about that. <laughs> like, they're, I was thinking, like, they're not listening to this at their party. Come on. <laughs> you know what I think it is? I think that. Uh, okay, I'll tell you what it is, uh, but I'll tell you my theory before I learned what the truth was, unfortunately. Uh, I think that it's – they're referring to staying alive, right? You want to stay alive. Okay, that's, what they're, that's, that's what they're doing. But maybe staying alive by the Bee Gees was too expensive, so they got – the Refugee All Stars uh, remix, we we trying to stay alive with John Forte. <laughs> I think they did okay. that instead. Now I laugh, but the Carnival that Wyclef Jean album is one of my favorite albums. I'm a huge Wyclef Jean fan, and so hell it yeah. was a real exciting for me to hear this. And like, who the hell likes uh, Wyclef Jean on the staff? I learned Alex Kurtzman suggested it. No, oh, well, now I have not- to live with the fact that I have the same musical taste as Alex Kurtzman. He's not so bad. <laughs> That's a good way to look at it. I, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I just always, I mean, we could do a whole another episode, but I just, I love it in the brief times where they show like what contemporary music sounds like in that world. And like, you know, they put all this focus on like designing creatures and characters and sets and settings. But, yeah, like, I know where you're going. I would going. love for someone to spend some time I, to like. I know think, where you're going. But then Think about we, the music. Yeah, but it's future music is never good. Whenever mm. they try to, you know, it's like when. Um, what about know. the Cantina Band in Star Trek, Star Wars? <laughs> okay, that, but oh that's, my God. Yeah, but that's just jazz, isn't it? Or jizz, I guess. It's jizz. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but like uh, <laughs> we haven't talked about jizz for a while on the show. Uh, but uh, whenever they try to like, somebody has like a oh here's my. Um, my uh, neon green plastic lute or something like that. And I'm going to play you my future song. It's like, it's never good. Oh, I love that. Even if it's bad. (laughs) (laughs) I like the fact that for all of the differences in Star Trek people, especially in the 24th century, whenever they go to a party, they're just eating cake 
and Rikers play the trombone. It just seems real like boring. <laughs> I like the yeah. fact that we see that mid 20th century people can still get down and play beer pong and they've got Al Green. So they're doing something right. Yeah, they, they, I mean, even this seems like a relatively tame party when you think about it. But, you know, I just feel like parties in the future might be even even wilder than we can imagine. It's only later on when Stamets starts singing uh, Ground Control to Major Tom with uh, <laughs> with Tilly that I think we've gone a little too far. That's, that's too much. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right. I think we have done it. We've made it we've to the Omega. We've covered a lot of ground. Yeah, there's, we've covered all the ground uh, and totally 100% of this thing. So we should probably move on. Let's tell people what we're talking about on our next show, which will come out in a week or two. Um, I think that we are going to move the show to every other week. I think that's probably the best way for uh, us to get your, your, your highest entertainment dollar of yeah, backtracking here. Get the good quality apps. Yeah, we're established way. now. We're established. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, okay. So for the next episode, we are, well, we've done every series so far except the animated series. That's right. So we're verging into that territory with the the, the Magics of Megas 2, which I've, I've never seen. I've never <sighs> seen the animated series, oh, actually. So, oh, and, really? Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I just... I don't know. I've just never done it. But, it's uh, funny how I think that it. when I talk to people on Enterprising Individuals about how they got into Star Trek, uh, if they're of a certain age, which is, you know, a little older than me and you, um, a lot of them say the animated series. Just in the same way huh. that, like, if you're the right age, you might have got into Ghostbusters by watching the real Ghostbusters. And then when you got older, went, oh, this Bill Murray movie. Cool. It's yeah. the same thing. Like they were Batman, young. It's kind of that way. Yeah, same X-Men. thing. X-Men. <laughs> but unfortunately, like the 90s X-Men cartoon, uh, Star Trek animated series hasn't persisted. Many people don't know it exists. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I maybe I've just always been aware because as soon as I got into Star Trek, I was like, I want to know it all. Yeah. But even though I wanted to know it all, I just, I don't know. I never went there. I was just kind of <laughs> heard it's like, you know, it's like an old cartoon. It's kind of hokey or whatever, but. I haven't actually watched it, so I'm excited to dive into that. Would a hokey show be written by people like Samuel A. Peebles and Larry Niven and have won an Emmy? You are you know, you might be right. I, I I haven't been fair to it. All right. Well, we're going to give it a chance. <laughs> oh, we and should that's... also say it's it's we're talking about how it relates to the Salem oh, Witch Trials. Yeah. Just slip that in at the end there. Oh, yeah. Uh, b- by the way, Salem Witch Trials. Would a hokey show talk about the Salem Witch Trials? <laughs> I don't think so. (laughs) Well, that's it for this week's Backtracking. And thanks for listening. If you like the show, tell a friend. Follow us at at Backtracking on Twitter. And tell us, too, on Twitter and other places what you think that we should look at in the future. We're always looking for recommendations for new episodes and uh, chances to get it right next time. So subscribe to us on Twitter. And we will see you again in two weeks. Gooey, tell people where they can find you on Twitter. Uh, you can find me on Twitter uh, at Gooey Fame. Uh, check out my other show uh, at uh, Virtual Theater, which is at Virtual Theater X on Twitter. We just had an episode about uh, House of the Dead come out, which is a oh disaster of a movie. <laughs> um, you might enjoy that episode. It was a lot of fun yeah. to watch and record. So yeah, the only thing I remember about that is a woman jumping up in the air <laughs> and shooting a shotgun because they had the gap commercial rig and they thought it looked cool. <laughs> Feel like a discount matrix. Yes. Gunshot. Yes. It's truly incredible. <laughs> and I'm at, at Caliban. That's K a one I B a N on Twitter. Find me there. Also find our network at, at just enough trope on Twitter and check out all of our fun shows. And that is it for us. We are signing off. We'll see you soon and keep on trekking. Trekking.